Good afternoon. I would like to welcome everybody to the inaugural subcommittee meeting of uh, the Federal Workforce, U.S. Postal Service and Labor Policy. Uh, I will ask the committee to come to order, and uh, as we have done in the Oversight uh, Committee and its subcommittees, I will start off by reading our mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient and effective government that works for, for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I will uh, start off, we will do uh, uh, opening statements from the Chair, from the Ranking Member, then the Chair of the Subcommittee, um, the, the whole Committee, and the Ranking uh, uh, Member of the whole Committee, I think, uh, may be here. We may have to adjourn for votes in the middle. Uh, if we do, I just ask for your patience. It will take about a half hour or so, and then we will be back and continue on. With that, I will start off with my opening statement. We are here today to discuss the looming crisis at the United States Postal Service. Today, the demand for traditional first-class mail continues to decline. Postal Service deficits continue to rise, and competition and benefit costs to continue to account for approximately 80 percent of the Postal Service's operating expenses. The Postal Service has said it will lack the necessary funds to make a required payment to prefund its retiree health care benefits that is due at the end of September. A continued imbalance between revenues and expenses means that taxpayers could ultimately be asked to bail out the Postal Service. This hearing presents an opportunity for lawmakers to hear important testimony from the front lines of the postal industry on how best to strengthen the Postal Service. For many years, the Postal Service has delivered mail six days a week to virtually every home in America, including over 170 billion pieces of mail in 2010 alone. But the Postal Service suffered from an operating, loss, uh, operating deficit of $8.5 billion in 2010 and projects further losses into the future. The ever-increasing reach of the Internet and digital media and the deep economic recession are the primary drivers of a, rap a rapid recent decline in mail volume. It is now clear that the need for workforce reductions and other cost-cutting measures must be the primary focus of the Postal Service its labor unions, and this Congress in order to improve the financial stabi stability of this venerable institution. Everyone that has a stake in the viability of the Postal Service must work together to find solutions. Postmaster General Patrick Donahoe recently outlined the Postal Service vision for a return to profitability. I commend you, sir, on that report and your commitment to reducing costs by undertaking major organizational restructuring, reviewing how best to provide retail postal services and implementing automation to improve delivery efficiency. Today, the Postal Service is negotiating labor contracts with two union groups representing postal employees. While some postal employee unions have cooperated on efforts to reduce the workforce through attrition and incentives for early retirement, those efforts simply have not resulted in the changes necessary to maintain a self-funding postal service. Realigning the postal workforce by reexamining labor agreements must be part of the strategy to improve the Postal Service fiscal foundation. Congress has an obligation to make statutory changes, if necessary, which will allow the Postal Service to address its own budget imbalance. We need to empower you. However, proposals for providing short-term fiscal relief, such as modifying retiree health benefits, prefunding payments or refunding so-called overpayments of the Civil Service Retirement System and the Federal Employee Retirement System, do not address the long-term systemic problem and solvency issues that must be tackled in order to address the, 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 the Postal Service will achieve long-term financial stability. Without a thorough reform of all aspects of, the, all aspects of the Postal Service's business model, there can be little hope that it will return to profitability in the near or long-term future. The looming fiscal crisis of the Postal Service can no longer be ignored. We have kicked that can far enough. I have the responsibility, no, we have the responsibility to change course and must consider all possible solutions. I thank the witnesses for appearing here today, and I look forward to their testimony. I now would like to recognize the distinguished member, uh, ranking member from Massachusetts, Congressman Lynch, for his opening statement. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me begin by congratulating you, uh, Chairman Ross, on your selection as the chairman of this important subcommittee. And I want to thank you for holding today's hearing, which shows your keen awareness of the critical state of affairs currently confronting the United States Postal Service. Now, while we have recently seen a moderate uptick in the economy and there are some indicators that suggest that standard mail or advertising mail is rebounding, our Nation's most trusted and prominent public institution continues to fall upon very difficult times. It is no secret that as more Americans use the Internet and email to conduct business and communicate, the less they use hard copy mail. Yet, even in light of uh, scores of uh, I'm sure, in light of declining mail volume, I'm sure there are scores of people that would agree with me that there, are still, uh, there is still great value in the traditional mail system. The Postal Service generated over $67 billion in annual revenue in fiscal year 2010 and employed roughly 58,000 workers in the delivery of 170 point, $170.6 billion pieces of mail to some 150 million residences, businesses and post offices. Uh, excuse me, post boxes uh, six days a week. Overall, the Postal Service is the cornerstone of a trillion dollar industry and supports over 7.5 million private sector American jobs, which highlights the vital role that the Postal Service plays in our overall economy. Uh, given the extraordinary financial challenges the Postal Service presently faces, it is absolutely necessary, and I agree, that we collectively, and by collectively, I I am referring to postal management, workers, mailers, as well as the administration and this Congress, come to the realization that there will have to be some difficult decisions made rather quickly in order to address the Postal Service's current financial situation. However, before we tackle issues such as changing delivery frequency and cutting services, laying off hardworking Americans, there are certainly some more palatable actions we should consider first. For example, we need to revisit the Postal Service's arbitrary and fixed retiree health benefit payment schedule, which prevents the organization from accounting uh, for the dramatic shifts in demand or workforce size that it has experienced in recent years. Simply requiring the Postal Service to tackle the obligations at such an aggressive pace is unheard of in the private sector and continues to be a driving force behind the Postal Service's dismal fiscal performance. Additionally, Questions continue to remain regarding both the Postal Service's actual civil service retirement system and its Federal employee retirement system obligations. For this reason, I intend, on, I intend to reintroduce legislation in the coming days, similar to what I offered last Congress on these issues, as well as on a couple of other substantive postal-related policy matters. However, in the meantime, I expect the Postal Service to continue to use its existing authorities to lower expenditures, raise revenues, and put forth fresh innovation in terms of both its competitive and its market dominant products and services. Further, the Government Accountability Office has recently completed work on a report that I had requested last Congress on the modernization of foreign posts and lessons learned, which I hope will also provide some useful information and novel ideas as we work on the Postal Service's long term viability. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses about their tangible and pragmatic suggestions or solutions for how best to return the Postal Service to financial solvency. After four years of operating deficits amounting to a cumulative loss in its four years of $20 billion and a nearly tapped out borrowing authority, we can no longer afford to kick this can down the road on this issue. Again, I thank you for holding this hearing and I again congratulate you on your, your chairmanship and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Lynch, and I, too, look forward to working with you in this regard. Uh, now I would like to recognize the distinguished gentleman from uh, California, Chairman of the uh, Oversight and uh, Government Reform Committee, uh, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for holding this important hearing. Above all else, the Government Oversight and Reform Committee is, in fact, the legacy committee of the Postal Committee. We take that seriously, that it is a primary piece of legislative authority and responsibility. Since 1970, this committee has overseen an independent agency responsible for its own balance sheet and profitability. There have been good years and bad years in that time, but no decade has been harder on the post, as, post office than the last decade. There has been a 20 percent <clears throat> uh, drop in postal volume over that period. The post office has lost $20 billion, going from having a relatively handsome surplus to being up against its uh, borrowing limit. 
we are here today to begin a process with the Postmaster and other stakeholders in finding a way to maintain certain prerequisites that this committee and the American people have counted on for over 200 years. First of all, the delivery of mail to every point in America. Second of all, the deliver, delivery of a level of service that Americans have come to expect. If at all possible, we want that to include all categories of mail, all types, and all delivery dates, meaning six days a week is a goal if we can achieve it. We also have an obligation for the American people to deliver value. Okay. The cost of mail is a cost to American commerce and to the American people. So every time there is an increase in postal rates, it is to the detriment of American efficiency and disposable income to the American people. Lastly and most importantly, this committee is dedicated to sustainability. The Post Office is not an organization you can have one day, not have the next, and put back up again. It has been there since our founding. It is a mandate of, a, uh, of Congress, in my opinion, since our founding, and it is memorialized in the Constitution. No Congress has ever suggested that we don't need a post office, and this will not ever be one in this committee. Postmaster General, I appreciate the fact that you have come in and relooked anew at your predecessor's initial uh, ideas. And I have seen some innovative and, I think, very worthwhile suggestions you have made. And some of them are tough. As we were talking before we came out here, the good news is there are at least two post offices that need to be closed in every congressional district in America. Let's hope there is not one or three in mine. <laughs> I want to commend the post office legacy of finding ways to pare down over 200,000 positions through attrition and buyouts. I might note, though, that today there are examples the American people, if aware of, would be surprised. There are over 15,000 postal workers over 65 years old who are on disability and not expected to return, and yet they are paid a full salary. That is an area that we expect will be addressed during our negotiations. It is an area in which we want to be fair to these long-working and long-standing uh, employees. But at the same time, if you can no longer do the job and you are over 65, there is a reasonable expectation that your status will change and you will not be counted among the active members of the postal system. I think this is particularly good in union negotiations because, in fact, what we want are workers who can be productively put to work, and those who cannot, we want to be fair to in any transition, whether they are over or under 65. Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent that my Washington Times op-ed of last year be included in the record. No objection. I thank you. In closing, this is not easy. Most of government needs are growing. Yours is not. Most of government has found new places in order to find authority and services. Yours has not and has not been offered the opportunity. This committee is willing to hear, though, about new services that create a value for the American people, opportunities for the Post Office to have further authority to find nexus and savings with other agencies or even the private sector. I believe that we can be entrepreneurial on both sides of the aisle for the better, better, betterment of the American people. I look forward to your testimony. I appreciate uh, all of you here testifying and the many stakeholders that are also in the audience today. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would now like to recognize the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, uh, Congresswoman Norton, for her opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will be pleased to be working with you as, as a member of the committee. And I am particularly pleased to welcome our new uh, Postmaster, Postmaster Donahue. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it was interesting to hear you. I know you, you read this, the, 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 the mission, uh, and, and that, that mission applies uh, most of the time. But it was really interesting to hear you say um, that you want to make sure that the money that comes from Washington is well spent. Well, of course, the Post Office hasn't gotten any money from Washington. Uh, for uh, decades now and won't get any. Uh, and, and indeed, we, so, we told the post office that it should run like a business. But the problem is that, we, that they report right here to the Congress. And um, they have never been given 
the kinds of latitude that, that a business uh, indeed has and probably doesn't feel that it could do what a business could do. For example, let's take something that under Chairman Lynch we discussed over and over again, and that was whether or not to reduce the six-day uh, week to a five-day. Now, that would cause some hardship in some parts of the country, of course. Uh, of course, if it's a private business, they have to take that into account and do what they have to do. Uh, I know in large parts of the country, uh, people, in, according to the polls, no longer say that they need a, a uh, six-day delivery and, and appear to be ready to give that up. I don't know. We haven't even discussed whether or not, well, okay, at least for the parts of the country that are willing, that, that don't need it, which looks like most of the country, why not at least then uh, have uh, a five-day work week? What is really um, frustrating to me as a member of this committee is uh, that the steps, even the, the, the baby steps, um, which wouldn't solve the problem, seem to be very difficult to take. And the case of the six-day work week is difficult to take for no reason except one reason, that is the members of the Congress of the United States. No business would have to bother with that. Um, I, 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 I will be very interested in this testimony and, and what you expect to be, be doing, um, uh, Postmaster. Uh, Donahue, because uh, this notion of a looming crisis, which is what um, this uh, hearing is called, is, is also <laughs> an interesting title. Ever since I have been on this committee, and I have been here since I have been a member of the Congress, it has been a looming crisis. I am not sure what we are waiting for. If the post office truly collapses, uh, you will have people rushing to the floor to say, let's pick up the post office one way or the other, I can't go home and tell people that there is going to be no postal delivery. I don't know whether excess payments to the trust funds, even if used for operational purposes, and we know that that is, um, that is very unlikely to occur, would be anything but a stopgap measure. I have always felt that somehow one has to pull back altogether and redesign entirely what we, need by, what we mean by postal service of the United States of America. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, Congressman Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I also want to welcome you, um, you as Chairman of the Committee. I would ask at this point, unanimous consent, to uh, insert in the record my opening statement describing a new uh, business model legislation I will be introducing in this Congress, an excerpt from the April 15, 2010 hearings we had uh, last year, and a copy of the testimony of the National Rural Letter Carriers Association. Well, without objection, it is so ordered. I thank the Chair. And also, uh, members will have seven days from today to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. Uh, now I would like to get into our uh, hearing for today. We have, do have two panels. For those of you that are following spring training, I like to refer to it as a double header today. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our first panel. Uh, to my immediate right is Mr. Patrick Donahoe, the Postmaster General and Chief Executive Officer of the United States Postal Service. In the middle is Ms. Ruth Goldway, the Chairman of the Postal Regulatory Commission. Welcome. And Mr. Hur, to my left, is the Director of Physical Infrastructure Issues at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. We have your uh, uh, written uh, statements before us, but what I would like to do first is to um, swear everyone in. And if I could ask you all to, to rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. In order to allow time for discussion and questions, uh, please limit your testimony to five minutes. Uh, as you know, your entire written uh, testimony will be part, made part of the record. Um, now I will recognize uh, first Mr. Donahoe. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I am honored to be testifying before you for the first time as a Postmaster General and Chief Executive Officer of the U.S. Postal Service. I appreciate the opportunity to testify and thank you for the invitation. Today I would like to discuss our financial challenges, steps we are taking to improve our competitive position, and improvements to our business model that require changes in the law. My view is that many of our challenges today can be recast as opportunities to create a profitable and more market responsive postal service that competes for and wins customers and that propels American commerce. The postal service remains at the heart of a crucial segment of our economy. 
If the Postal Service was a private sector company, it would rank 29th in the Fortune 500. We provide the platform for a mailing industry that pumps $1 trillion into the economy every year and employs 7.5 million Americans. We are not taxpayer funded. We generate our revenue through the sale of postage. And so, if we are to be successful at our core function of delivering to the American public, we must operate by having a strong business model and effective business strategies. For its part, the Postal Service is focused on managing on what it controls. In 2010, we trimmed $3 billion in costs on top of $6 billion in savings in 2009, and our plan this year is to take another $2 billion out, further reducing work hours by $40 million. Our achievements in the workforce reduction accompanied, accomplished, have been accomplished through uh, attrition. We are unsurpassed in public and private sectors in that manner. We have reduced our workforce by almost 230,000 employees since the year 2000 and have dramatically increased total productivity. We have accomplished this all without sacrificing service. Performance levels are at the highest level ever, and those results lie squarely with our dedicated, knowledgeable, and committed employees, and I could not be any more proud of them. We are aligning every aspect of the Postal Service around four key strategies. One, strengthening the business and consumer channel. Two, improving the customer experience by making every transaction a positive transaction. Three, competing for the package business. And four, continuing to become leaner, faster, and smarter. We are committed to ensuring that we will be successful in these business strategies and that we will be able to serve the American public better as a result. While we are being very aggressive within the constraints of our current business model, the fact is, without some important changes to the law that shape our business model, we cannot survive as a self-financing entity. Mr. Chairman, the losses experienced by the Postal Service last year alone are a staggering $8.5 billion. This year we are projected to lose another $6.4 billion. Certainly, these results reflect the migration to electronic communication and shifting customer habits. But upon closer examinations, our losses are a result of an inflexible business model due to the laws that govern the Postal Service. The most serious challenge is to our unique obligation to prefund retiree health benefits. This prefunding requirement, borne by no other entity, public or private, places an incredible burden on the Postal Service. To understand the full effects, you just have to look at the last few years before and after the enactment of the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act. In the four years before the PAEA, the Postal Service showed a positive net income every year. In the four years since, we have seen billion dollars in losses every year. Even during the two worst years of the recession, 2007 and 2008, had it not been for the prefunding requirement, the Postal Service would have realized a net profit of $3.3 billion and $2.8 billion, respectively. The effects of the retiree health benefit prefunding are profound. This trend continues into 2011. Our first quarter results showed a loss of $329 million, excluding retiree health benefits, prefunding costs, and along with workers' compensation adjustments, we would have had a net income of $226 million. In addition to the retiree health benefit obligations, overpayments into the Civil Service Retirement System and Federal Employee Retirement System have taken a significant toll on our finances. Restoring these funds to the Postal Service would obviously benefit our financial position. This year, the Postal Service will reach statutory debt limit. Liquidity concerns are looming because of a $5.5 billion payment for retiree health benefits due on September 30th of this year. The Postal Service will not have the cash available to make these payments. We need legislation this year to address that fact. I also encourage the subcommittee to provide greater flexibility to the Postal Service regarding our proposed transition from five, from to a five-day delivery schedule, enabling greater latitude in the way that we provide access to postal products and services. Several bills were introduced in the 111th Congress that did just that. We appreciate those efforts and are looking forward to working with each of you in the 112th Congress. I believe strongly that the path forward requires that we embrace fundamental change and that our employees, our labor unions, management associations, the mailing industry, all of our customers and business partners play a constructive role in shaping our future. I am committed to this approach. The next few years will bring significant change, but I am confident that we will be able to look back and say that working together, we took advantage of a challenging time to create a stronger organization and a stronger industry. 
developing a true 21st century postal service. Thank you for your continued efforts on behalf of the Postal Service. I look forward to working with each of you and will be happy to answer your questions today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Donahoe. Ms. Goldway, you are recognized. I might need to address the mic there, just push that button. Thank you, Chairman Ross uh, and Ranking Member Lynch and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify on the record of the PAEA and Postal Service finances. I look forward to your views and your leadership on postal issues. On the whole, we can say that the PAE has been a positive force for change, keeping postage rates low and service at acceptable levels, while providing stakeholders with information and the opportunity to participate in the process. The price cap serves as a powerful incentive for the Postal Service to add efficiency and reduce costs, including $11 billion in the last three years. At the same time, the requirement to measure service and report the results publicly ensured that the Postal Service improved service quality. Seasonal pricing incentives for standard and first class mail, five experimental product market tests, and the expanding use of NSAs, 127 in 2010 and 56 to date in 2011, show that the service is taking advantage of the law's pricing flexibilities. Along with some others, I have been concerned that there are some potentially irreconcilable legislative requirements in the law, such as that all products must cover attributable costs, but no class of mail can have rate increases greater than the CPI cap. But to date, the Commission has been able to justify reasonable exceptions and to encourage the Postal Service to address others. In the recent exigency case, the Commission carefully reviewed the Postal Service's current financial predicament and found it to be structural related to the pre-funding of health benefit premiums for future retirees. In the past four years, the Postal Service has paid nearly $21 billion into the Retiree Health Benefit Fund, while incurring a cumulative net loss of $20 billion. Bottom line, without the RHBF, the Postal Service would have broken even despite the impact of the recession and declining mail volumes. Of course, when the PAE was enacted in 2006, the economy was strong and the Postal Service had record profits. It was in this climate that the Congress mandated the Postal Service to make an ambitious, fixed 10-year series of payments at about $5.5 billion. But in retrospect, the, F the RHBF payments have brought the Postal Service deep into debt and close to insolvency. Now, even with a brightening economy and continued cost cutting, the Postal Service cannot surmount its financial crisis without Congressional action. In 2009, at the request of Congress, our expert review of the OPM's computation of the RHBF liability found that a recalculation could lower the Postal Service's liability by nearly $35 billion, still meet the funding goals of the Act, and allow the required annual payments to be lowered. This could significantly address the Postal Service's financial shortfall. Last year, at the request of the Postal Service, we undertook expert actuarial studies to review whether the Postal Service CSRS pension obligations have been properly calculated in relation to wages of employees of the Post Office Department who later retired from the Postal Service. We found that the Postal Service had been overcharged by an estimated $50 to $55 billion. The surplus, which came from postal revenues, not taxes, should be made available in some fashion for the benefit of the postal ratepayers and customers, perhaps to fund the RHBF. The Commission believes that given the Postal Service's record of cost cutting over the last decade and recognizing the price cap restrictions and competition from electronic alternatives, significant cost cuttings will continue. The Commission will serve to guard against any ill-considered cuts because any reduction in service could be viewed as an equivalent of a de facto rate increase. Last year, the Commission issued its advisory opinion on Postal Service's proposals to shutter up to 3,200 stations and branches. We affirmed the Postal Service's authority to adjust its retail network, but we made several recommendations to ensure consistency and enhance due process for every citizen. Over the last year, the Commission has conducted an extensive review of another Postal Service proposal that to go from six to five day delivery. In my 13 years serving on the Commission, this has been the most difficult and multifaceted issue I have been asked to address. The Postal Service proposal to end Saturday delivery is a serious effort to improve its bottom line. But cutting 17 percent of service in order to save what the Postal Service estimates to be $3 billion 
must be carefully considered within our obligation to hold prices down, maintain service standards, and ensure efficient postal operations. We are working overtime to resolve the complex and technical policy aspects of this case and expect our com uh, to complete our opinion shortly. We hope the opinion provides the Congress with the information you need to decide whether or not to lift the current six-day delivery directive. The Commission is now conducting its first five-year review of the PAEA required under Section 701 of the Act to provide recommendations to improve the effectiveness of current postal laws. Certainly, the historic view that the postal system itself is of enduring value to the Nation still stands strong. We look forward to working with Congress, the Postal Service, and all who depend on the mail to chart a course that keeps the mail affordable, efficient, and relevant for generations to come. Thank you. That concludes my testimony. I would like to ask that the uh, statement I made with regard to the exigency rate gate, which further defines the finances of the Postal Service, be included in the record as well. Without objection. Thank so you. Ordered. Thank you, Ms. Goldway. Uh, Mr. Hur, you are recognized. Thank you. Chairman Ross, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the committee. I am pleased to be here today to participate in this hearing. Today I will discuss the Postal Service's financial condition and outlook and the actions needed to modernize and restructure it. The Postal Service's financial condition has declined significantly since fiscal year 2006, and it remains on GAO's high-risk list. As discussed, the challenges facing the Postal Service are linked to, de to decreases in mail volumes as customers have shifted to electronic communications and payment alternatives. More specifically, profitable first-class mail has been declining relatively quickly. While mail use has been declining, the Postal Service has large fixed costs associated with delivering to 150 million addresses. It also has a large physical network spanning over 500 mail processing facilities and more than 32,000 post offices. It has 670,000 employees, about 80 percent of whom work full time. And compensation and benefits, as you noted, comprise 80 percent of its costs. The Postal Service expects to reach its $15 billion statutory debt limit this year while still facing a cash shortfall. Unfunded obligations and liabilities, detailed in a table in my statement, for such things as workers' compensation and expenses and retiree health care are now estimated to total $105 billion. These figures strongly suggest the Postal Service's financial condition has reached a tipping point, and key stakeholders need to reach agreement on actions to address its structural problems. We believe that action is needed in five areas. First, realign service with customers changing use of the mail. The Postal Service has sought to reduce delivery by one day and provide retail services outside of post offices. It estimates that dropping a day of delivery could reduce its cost by about $3 billion annually. This raises questions about what aspects of universal postal service are appropriate given declines in mail use. Second, postal operations, networks, and its workforce need to be realigned to reduce excess capacity. Key questions include, how quickly can these networks be realigned? The pace of change has simply been too slow. And should some post offices move to alternate, alternate locations to better serve customers and reduce costs? Third, compensation and benefit costs need to be addressed. Wages and benefits represent 80 percent of postal costs about $60 billion in fiscal year 2010. Congress may wish to consider revisiting the statutory framework for collective bargaining to ensure that binding arbitration takes the Postal Service's financial condition into account. Other options include implementing a two-tier pay system, outsourcing if it results in cost savings, or revising employees' share of health and life insurance premiums. Fourth, generating revenue through new or enhanced products and services. The Postal Service has asked Congress to allow it to diversify into non-postal areas and sought additional pricing flexibility. Questions about this include, are there opportunities to introduce profitable new postal products and enhance existing ones? Should it be allowed to enter non-postal areas to compete with private sector providers? Finally, the funding structure for postal retiree health benefits needs to be addressed. The roughly $5 billion-plus payments through 2016 are steep and we believe that Congress should consider modifying them in a fiscally responsible manner. However, we also believe the Postal Service should prefund these obligations to the maximum extent its finances permit, because thousands of individuals rely on and expect this benefit. 
Making changes to the Postal Service will not be easy. In a recent report by, requested by Ranking Member Lynch, we discussed how foreign posts have modernized their operations. Key aspects of these changes included strategic outreach and coordination with stakeholders about the nature, scope, and need for changes. An employee transition strategy was also crucial. Foreign post experience suggests the Postal Service needs to clarify its modernization plans, including over what period it will implement them, and explain improvements in customer service and cost savings it expects while ensuring that alternatives are available. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, modernizing and restructuring the Postal Service so that it can be viable is imperative given its financial condition. This will not be easy, and changes, some difficult, are needed to ensure that postal services remain available. I am pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herr. Uh, and we will now move into the uh, questions, and I will recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, I want to jump right into what I think is really the heart of, of the first issue that we are facing, and that is the PAEA and its, its aftermath today. And, and Ms. Goldway, I know you, you acknowledge that, that the Commission is doing a study on that. Specifically, at the time the PAEA was um, um, passed in 2006, we had certain assumptions that I think may have been taken into consideration to, add, to go ad infinitum. For example, 800,000 employees at the time. Now we are down to 575,000, a decline in first class mail. My question, and I will go to Mr. Donahoe first, is with this pre funding of the, of the, um, uh, the pension benefit, um, are there not assumptions that, that today may not exist or, or have changed dramatically that in and of itself, if actuarially identified, could reduce the obligation of the Postal Service that is being imposed by the PAEA? We, we believe so, Mr. Chairman. We think that um, if you take a look at the intentions behind the law that was passed in 2006, they were very good intentions. The expectation was that the Postal Service, uh, having uh, a base volume of 213 billion pieces of mail, along with no debt at the time, could carry that uh, burden of the health benefits going forward. It was a responsible idea. We still think it is a responsible idea to, to account for our retiree health benefits going forward, but we think uh, there is a number of things we have to take into consideration. Number one, we have had a substantial drop in volume. That has to be considered. Number two, to your point, we have reduced headcount. I think back in 2006, uh, whenever we first, uh, when the law was passed, it was based on the assumption of uh, 757,000 employees. Today we have about 570,000 employees, and we think that moving forward we will eventually break into the 400,000 rank. We know going forward we will not have those same burdens. So we would ask that, that Congress uh, take a look, ask the, uh, the GAO to examine what the actual liability is going forward. We also think there are some solutions as far as how to fund that. We think that the funds that are existing in the civil service retirement funds that we have overpaid by our estimates, $75 billion, uh, the Postal Regulatory Commission's estimates, $55 billion, could be used to make that payment. If that is not available, we think that we can also look at some other options. Our own IG has suggested that we take a look forward around the, uh, the option of, of taking a private sector model where you fund at 30 percent versus the 100 percent that we are required to now. So there are many options on the table, <coughs> excuse me, and we would be more than happy to explore any of those with, with you. Thank you. Ms. Goldway, would you have any estimate as to what, based on new assumptions? Well, as to what the reduction could be or potentially what, be? What we did in 2009, working with consultants, the Mercer and the Hay Group, is to uh, look at the OPM projections and factor in lower uh, levels of employees uh, and uh, to adjust the uh, expectations of health care cost increases that the OPM had in their formula. And we estimated that the, in order to fund 100 percent of what would be the health care retiree benefit problem, you could do it with $35 billion less money than the OPM had estimated in 2006. I would suspect that that number might even be lower today than it was in 2009 when we did it, and that, therefore, the target for what the Postal Service needs to pay into a health care retiree benefit fund is lower, and the annual payments that they make into it could be adjusted downward and reduce their burden. Their Any idea how much? I mean, well, we had estimated about two billion a year reduction or, or re reduction okay. from. So instead of five billion, it would be two billion. But but I, that was an estimate, and again, it would need 
the assistance of OPM and perhaps GAO to, 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 to clarify it. those numbers. Thank you. Mr. Donahoe, of course, one side of the, the, the issue is the, the ongoing uh, liability for the, the, the prefunding. But the other side is a systemic change. And what we have got to do, and this is what I would ask your opinion on, is how do we go about competing in the 21st century? How do we go about uh, now adapting to the digital age? And, and I think that, that once we, if we are able to do something and empower the Postal Service to take care of the, the, the immediate need, but how does it go on from hereafter so that it is existing for another 235 years without any subsidies? Well, first of all, Mr. Chairman, we think that there is a tremendous upside on the top line on our revenue in, in, in the Postal Service and the entire industry. We think there is plenty of growth available in the area of standard mail. Standard mail is the most direct way to get in front of a customer's eyes, better than the Internet, better than TV, better than radio. So we know there is growth there. We also know there is growth in the package market, and we have been exploring that. We have been working with a number of new products. You have seen our flat rate products come out. We have introduced a number of others coming forward. As a matter of fact, we, uh, Ms. Goldway showed me we, we brought along a copy of our free sample box that they have just approved over at the uh, Regulatory Commission. We think there is a ton of value in that. We think that this is an opportunity on a monthly basis for people to get into the sample business in a very affordable way. So we, we know there is an upside. Now, on the first class mail, as you mentioned, it is declining. But we think that by using uh, NSA's uh, contracts with many of our customers, we can actually slow down the pace of change with the uh, drop off in first class. Congressman Lynch mentioned some opportunities in digital, and we are exploring that, too. We have had some really good ideas come back from an innovation summit, along with a number of other ideas that we have been exploring with partners. Digital to hard copy, hard copy to digital, and even digital to digital. We know that the Postal Service provides tremendous opportunities and, and, and security in that entire market, and we think there is plenty of opportunity for growth there, too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time is up. Uh, now to recognize the distinguished gentleman. Uh, are we going to provoke, or have they called us? You can. If, if no objection, uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Lynch. For questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for your, your help. Uh, Mr. Donahoe, let me push back on that a little bit. I, I know I have spoken with uh, Pitney Bowes and a number of other uh, firms that uh, operate in Europe uh, as well, and they have got some systems where, where you can actually pull up on your laptop or on your iPad and actually click on your mail before it is before delivered. And you can click off the stuff that you don't want to have delivered and you know, click on the stuff you'd like to have delivered. But that tells me that with technology, there will be a further reduction in volume as, as, uh, as, as people uh, are given that option. And so I'm not so sure I buy into the idea that we're actually going to be able to increase volume. Um, but that much being said, um, let's, let's go back to where the Chairman was, was uh, considering uh, PAIA. Uh, what does it look like right now? And Mr. Hur, you might be able to jump. Actually, Ms. Goldway as well. Uh, what is if we're overfunding future retiree health benefits? What is what is the measurement of that overpayment? Do we have a do we have a sense of that? I know they're making you full fund it in advance, uh, and no one else is required to to. Uh, operate under that standard, but I am just wondering what the overpayment is in there right now. Well, I don't think there is there's no overpayment in the health care retiree benefit fund at the moment. There is about $42 but billion. But it is prefunded. I mean, if, if in the, what I am trying to do is, is uh, so benefit fund, there is, in, in the civil service No, no, yeah, I, I know that. I know that. Okay, look, you have ordinary health benefit plans right. that are required to pay in annually. They are not required to prefund, okay? Right. So if you compare the prefunding requirement to a, quote, unquote, normal health care benefit uh, uh, requirement, what excess do we have in there uh, that if we were required to meet normal fund, uh, health care fund obligations, what, what would be in there that uh, would not be required under a standard system? I'm not sure I understand, but I think what it means, what you're talking about, is that the Postal Service currently pays out of its existing revenues the the money it needs to pay for retirees' health care benefits, and that's about two and a half billion dollars a year, uh, and there's 42 billion dollars in a fund. So one could 
either take some of that money to, to pay the existing health care retiree benefit retirees funds or at least take uh, some income from that to help pay that off. Uh, that, uh, I think that is what you are referring to. Another way to look at it uh, is potentially, Congressman, um, the, the, the estimate for the prepayment that was needed back in 2006 was $90 billion. Okay. RIG has done a study uh, looking at uh, regular businesses, private firms, and what their requirements to pay. The average prepays at about 30 percent. So their recommendation has been you would owe somewhere around $30 billion. We paid $42 billion to it already, so theoretically okay. we are overfunded at that rate. Okay. I think that, that probably answers the question. Okay. Mr. Mr. Lynch, if yeah, I may. Yeah, Mr. Hare, go ahead. In, in my statement, we actually report the data that the Postal Service had in its annual financial report. And there is, as, they, as was stated, there is about $42 billion in that fund. But the unfunded liability is $48.6 billion, as calculated by OPM using Postal Service numbers, and is reported in the financial, annual financial report. Yeah. And, and that is the, that's the part that our consultants that's, thought could be lowered. That, so that, that's, that's and that is for all future employees who are not necessarily going to tap into the fund in, in one year, year though, yeah, right? right? Correct. At some point. All right, let, me, let me ask you this, then. Uh, I know you are running out of money, Mr. Donahoe, uh, this year. I mean, with the obligations you have got uh, for the health benefit uh, and, and, uh, and other obligations, you get a workman's compensation payment for yep. $1.3 billion, I think. That's enough. When does that happen and what do you do when you run out of money? Here is the thing. September 30th, we finish the fiscal year. I will owe the Federal Government $5.5 billion for the prefunding. In November, I will owe another $1.3 billion for workers' comp. Uh, at the end of the fiscal year, I am out of cash. I have three you are also up against your debt limit. I am up against debt limits, so there is no breathing room. We will deliver mail. We will pay the employees and deliver mail. We will make sure that we pay our suppliers. Uh, they are providing contract transportation, et cetera, et cetera. The thing we will not do is be able to pay the Federal Government. That will have to be negotiated. We will talk with the Board of Governors, come back with the Treasury and figure out what we have to do. That is why it is so important that we address this. Okay. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Uh, the subcommittee will now stand in recess until probably five minutes after the last vote. I expect it will probably be about 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.